All right, well, tonight we're talking about expectations. That's the sermon title is High Expectations. And there's something about expectations, guys. We're all pretty familiar with the concept, right? Reality versus expectations. We've seen all the memes. The expectation that you have on something has a great effect on the situation, and it can even ruin the reality. Does anyone here like to bake? Bake cookies, maybe? Muffins? Okay, yes, I like to bake. I wouldn't say that I'm good at it necessarily, though, and that's incredibly frustrating to me, and here's why. It's not because I'm a perfectionist, no. It's because in my mind, baking should be very easy. Because it's a lot like math. Does anyone like math? Any math lovers? Yes, don't be ashamed. You're going to run the world one day. Um, it's a lot like math. There's a formula to baking, right? As long as I have the formula, I'm going to get the right answer. I'll always find X. That's why I love math. You just give me the ingredients. I'll put it into the batter. And yet, guys, almost every single time something goes wrong. And I do all of the steps. Does this happen to anyone else? Right? Thank you. Thank you. I'm not alone in this. I use the timers. I use the measuring cups. I put the specified temperature of the oven, and everything goes wrong. And then when my cookies come out of the oven, they look like poop emojis, and they also taste like poop emojis. I'm not going to lie. Like, really, last time Andy and I made cookies, we were like, poop emojis, and then they tasted like it. Um, so I was curious if I was alone, so I surfed the web to see if other people had also experienced the same thing that I did. Um, the trauma of expectations when I baked my food. And here are some marvelous pictures that I thought I'd show you guys. The first one, can you see it? Do you guys ever build gingerbread houses? It's the worst. Well, let's see the second one. <laughs> Santa, are you okay? Okay, um, do you guys watch the Great British Bake Off? Have you seen them like try to bake the bread? No, I can't. Let's see the next one. Okay, these bears, what is wrong with their eyes? Let's see the next one. BB-8, this one's kind of okay. Like he tried really hard. Kudos, kudos. Let's, let's see the next one. Okay, this one, there was so much work and detail. The number of strings is correct and frets. It's just like it sat in the car for a really long time. Okay, and the next one. <laughs> this is the last one. Oh, is it? No, it's not. Are you okay, SpongeBob? I don't even want to look at it. Let's go to the next screen. It's so. This one is my favorite because it just says sorry. <laughs> sorry, I tried, right? Unfortunately, guys, this happens with so many other areas in our life uh, that matter a lot more than baking. So when you leave service today, guys, there are three things that I hope that you walk away with. Here are they. When God calls you to something you will most likely have to leave something behind. There are expectations of the world, and then there are realities of God. And third, exchange the expectations of the world for the realities of God. Expectations, that's what we're talking about. And to help us understand what God has to say about it, we're reading in Genesis 12. So if you want to pull out your smartphones and get into Genesis 12. Now, Genesis 12 is the origin story if you will, for the will of God throughout the Bible. It is the your wizard Harry scene. It is the Bilbo Baggins leaving his shire, Bella realizing that Edward is a vampire, the scene in the Lego movie where Emmett realizes that he's the chosen one. It's Troy Bolton deciding to try out for his high school musical scene. It is the calling out to the great unknown of our main character, Abram. Not Abraham yet, he's Abram which I want a name change. Did any of you guys get nicknames and you didn't want them? Right? Adri's okay, like it's all right, but I wanted to be called Anna for whatever reason. And so I would tell people when I was little, like, hi, you can call me Anna. Two seconds later, cool, Adri. And I'm like, <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Prince was a symbol, but I can be Adri. Okay, let's read this together. Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and all the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah in Sheshem. And that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and I on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord called the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward Negev. All right, something I wish that I had in this scripture was an inner monologue. Do you guys know what an inner monologue is? Like when you watch a movie or you read a story and you're hearing the thoughts of the main character. Do you guys know Lizzie McGuire? Okay, she had like an inner monologue cartoon. That's what I wish I had because when you read this, Abram seems pretty robotic, like he just goes. The Lord just talks to him and he just goes. But if God had called you or I to leave everything we'd known behind for him, to go to a land that we had no idea about, I would be scared. Wouldn't you? No, you wouldn't be scared? Well, I, I would be scared. And we're young guys. We live in an individualistic culture. What I mean by that is culture actually encourages us to chase our dreams to leave everything behind, to follow our own will. We have nothing holding us back except our comfort. But in Abram's traditional society, leaving your homeland, everything you know behind you was completely unheard of. He risked everything that he held most dear to follow God's call. And mind you guys, this was a God whom he'd never heard of before this. So let's read that verse again, the first verse. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, when I read that verse the first time, guys, there were two things that I saw. Leave behind and go. God calls Abram to do two things, to leave behind and go. Abram obviously couldn't go without leaving everything behind. And I know that that seems logical to us in our minds, but here's the reality. That's sometimes a little more difficult to leave out. Because when God calls you to something, you guys to something, you will most likely have to leave something behind. Now we're gonna talk more about that later, but let's continue to these next verses. Verse six, this is what the Lord says. This is the call, this is the promise. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed by you. Now here's what I think happens when we hear a promise like that from the Lord. We think, if we were Abraham, we'd think to ourselves, well, how am I going to make that happen? Because that's how we approach every single thing in our life. The expectations that we have on ourselves to be the most beautiful, the most filtered, the most aesthetically pleasing influencer, right, which really what we're saying is somebody tell me that I'm worthy of love. The expectation that we take on ourselves that we better do something of significance with our lives right now, I believe that there's a reason that those things actually suck the life out of our souls. There was a picture that I got in my mind when I got to this part in the sermon, and it's that we're all plants. We're all plants, and we're in desperate need of water. But instead, somebody is pouring soda all over the plant. And it sure looks a lot like water, but it's not. And what happens? The plant's going to die, right? Because it's not getting the actual thing that it needs to live. You see, these expectations, they don't fuel us. They rob us, and it's not what we need to live. You guys are known as Generation Z. Have you guys heard that before? Generation Z. I'm a millennial. You're Generation Z. You guys have been called millennials on steroids. <laughs> you were raised on smartphones. Many of you guys can't even remember a time before social media. Can anyone actually remember a time before social media in this room? 
I take that back. Scratch, scratch, scratch. I'm not going to say that tomorrow. You take information in instantaneously, and then you lose it just as fast. Your optimism has been replaced by pragmatism because of the kind of world you had to grow up in. I know those were big words. I'm going to explain it right now. What I mean is, you most likely grew up within economic turmoil, global instability, and it was all at your fingertips. There is no line for you guys between the online world and the real world. And it's not as if you're unaware to all of these realities. You're, in fact, painfully aware because there's no escape, because it all goes with you quite efficiently in your pocket. Political turmoil, racial war, not to mention the pressures of appearing to have it all together, to get into that school, to get into that job. And there is a part of me that didn't want to mention any of these things to you guys today because it's not super fun. But then I realized that you guys are all, you already know it. You're already aware of it. And this is affecting your generation. I probably don't have to mention that rates of anxiety, depression, and self-harm have gone up. Researchers got 1.7 million search results for hashtag self-harm in 2014. By 2015, that number was more than 2.4 million. And now it's 2019, and I don't know where that number is. Here's the thing. All of those things that I mentioned, they are all outside of God's design for us. There are expectations of the world, but they are not the Lord's expectations. And yet, we wear them like a badge of honor, and it's killing us. What has God actually called us to? Well, there are only two things that God called Abram to. He needed him to be obedient, and that was in leaving behind his life, and going to where the Lord had called him to, to leave behind and to go. This is a common theme throughout scripture. I'm not just pulling this out of nowhere. That's why I can pretty confidently say to you guys tonight that this is still God's message for us today. It says so in Matthew 10, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Or what about Philippians 3.8? Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So what does God actually expect of you? Well, everything, everything. But he doesn't need you to be anything. He just wants your everything. You're all of you. But he'll handle the rest because he's trustworthy and he's good and his ways are better, better than what you've been settling for, better than what's been handed to you by culture and society. So let's read what the Lord actually says to Abram again, because there's something that I think that we miss at first glance, and we're going to put a special version of this one on the screen. There's going to be bold words, and we're going to read it together, and when we get to the bold, I want you guys to say it a little louder than the other words. Is that okay? Can you just shout it with me? Let's see if we have that version. Do we have the bold version? All right, let's read it together. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed by you. Good job. There are a few things that stand out now that we've read that. First, who is doing the work here? That's right, God. And second, do you notice that he doesn't say, I might make you into a great nation, or I could if you would just try hard enough? No, he says, I will. I will. The great I am says, I will. And so we see that that, in fact, is a reality. And all that God actually re requires of us is obedience. There is a great exchange that needs to take place within each of us that I believe God is calling 
all of us in this room, adults included, because there are expectations of the world and then there are realities of God. So we need to exchange the expectations of the world that burden us for the realities of God. In Matthew 11, it's one of my favorite verses, it says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Or 1 Peter 5. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I think you guys are pretty familiar with anxiety. You're pretty familiar with stress. You're pretty familiar with burden. He says, cast them all on me and I will give you rest. How do we exchange what's been given to us? We build an altar. We build an altar. At the end of this scripture, Abram does something important and we're gonna read it together. It's in verse six. It says, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah, Sheshem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there for the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel at the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. At the end of this story, Abram builds an altar. Now in that time, guys, building an altar was an act of thankful worship. It kind of just looked like a bunch of rocks on top of each other. It was an act of worship and remembrance. Why did Abram do this? Because it's the only natural response to the gracious promise that God had given him. So when we worship, guys, every week, when we come here, we ask you guys to stand up, to come forward. What we are in fact doing is building an altar for the Lord. We are exchanging the expectations of the world that we've been bearing on our backs all week long that we're not even aware of for the reality that God has for us. We are casting all of our cares, all of our burdens, all of our anxieties on the Lord and exchanging it for the reality that he's faithful and he will do his good work in us. So when you leave here today, guys, I hope that you take away these truths. When God calls you to something, you will most likely have to leave something behind. There are expectations of the world and then there are realities of God, so let's exchange the expectations for the realities of God. You guys have a handout in front of you, hopefully. And you'll see that there's not much on there because there isn't really much to this sermon because it's simple in understanding, but it's difficult in execution. It says expectation. What is it that you have to leave behind? What is your leave behind? Truth is, some of you already know what to write down. And I know because I've been in your seats before. I told you I grew up in this ministry. You've been sitting there and the Holy Spirit has been bringing up those bad habits. He's been bringing up those friendships that are toxic, the expectations of the world that you've took on as a badge of honor that you need to leave behind in exchange. And if he hasn't been doing that right now, sit right now and say, Holy Spirit, what do I need to exchange? What do I need to leave behind? And write those down. And what about reality? What is the reality God is calling to you? What is the go? Who do you need to be loved to? What are you called to do? What's the next good thing? Now, some of you may be a tad lost on this one, and when I was in your seats, I would have been too, honestly. But we need to realize something, that God did not tell Abram exactly how he was going to accomplish his promise. He just said, I'll show you when you get there. And it's still like that for us today. What is the next right step? Dusty says that. What is the next good thing that God is calling you to? Who does God need you to love? Who does he need you to serve, to forgive, to share Jesus with? What is your go? You can write those down in that blank. There was a, like, crazy, like, 
wreck your mind kind of thought that I had when I was piecing together this sermon, and it was this. God's reality of what he can do with my obedience will always be greater than anything I could imagine. I don't think Abram could have even grasped that through his lineage, the savior of the world was going to come and save us all. God just said, follow me, go. Because sometimes we see just in part. When God gives us a word or a call or a nudge to go be friends with that person or go talk to someone or go forgive that person, what we actually see as God being able to do with our yes is so small and comparable, probably laughable with what he can and actually wants to accomplish with our yes. Now, there's another aspect of this that I want to touch on. He told Abram, I'm going to make you into a great nation. What's important for us to remember is later we learned that Abram and Sarah could not have children. But those facts did not matter to God because with God, the impossible becomes irrelevant. God is something that we can and should dare to partner our realities with. Because his promises, guys, they're exactly that. They're promises. They're not a wish and they're not a hope. They are as sure as they are steadfast. And so many of us, we are living half a life or we're, re we're beginning to live half a life. We're holding on to, we're clinging on to these expectations of the world for dear life when the Father just wants us to exchange them because his burden is easy and his yoke is light. When I got to writing, there was a story that I couldn't get out of my mind that Dusty used to tell all the time when I was sitting in your seats. And it's the story of um, every time when he would come home after work, Asher was four, he would come home and he would open the garage and he would come into the door. Um, and like anyone, like any kid, Asher would want to run to his dad. But there were some times that Asher would have all these toys in his hand, and then he would have to make a decision, right? Am I going to hold on to Buddy, to Buzz Lightyear? Am I gonna hold on to him and just say hi to my dad? Or am I gonna let them go, and am I gonna run to him? I think, guys, in that story, we're that little boy, but the toys that we're holding on to, they're not toys. And they're not fun, and they don't satisfy, and they don't actually make us happy. No, exchange them for my open arms, says the Father. Yes, it's going to cost us everything, but it's worth it because his burden is easy and his yoke is light. And what I love about that story is either way Asher was with his dad, right? saying hi, but when he exchanged the toys, like Dusty was so much better than anything he could have been playing with, right? He could throw them higher, he could spend time, he could make them laugh. It's so much better than what we're settling for. Yes, it will cost you everything, yes. Because when God calls you to something, you will most likely have to leave something behind. Because there are expectations of the world and then there are realities of God. So let's exchange the expectations of the world for the realities of God. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you so much for the simplicity of your word. That there are times when we come across scripture and it seems so simple. Such a beautiful truth. It's like you're unveiling our eyes for the first time and you're showing us that these things that we are striving for, that we're holding on to, that we want to become that next person, the next influencer, the next person of substance, that that in fact would rob us, that you have a life that is so much more abundant than anything we could even dream up in our minds. Lord, would these students here tonight not settle for what's been handed to them? 
Would they dare to dream? Would they dare to partner with your reality, God, of what you have for them? That your yoke is easy, that your burden is light, that you did not have anxiety for them or depression for them or stress, God, or sleepless nights. That you are the prince of peace and that your peace surpasses all understanding. Holy Spirit, do your work in these students. This week, as they leave, do your work in them and reveal to them, God, the exchanges that they need to make before you to take upon your yoke that is light and your burden that is easy. It's in your name that we pray.